Hello and welcome to Death Drive Dialectics. I'm Nicholas Tolliver here with Tyler Mraz to talk about Kant, Saad, Lacan through the, the vehicle of Batman and the Joker. Batman and the Joker sort of provide the perfect metaphor for the relationship between Kant and Saad, a relationship which isn't immediately clear, but Lacan tried to clarify this relationship between these two seemingly opposed figures. On the one hand, you have Kant's moral philosophy, which is very much structured around the categorical imperative. And on the other side, you have Saad's philosophy of sort of hedonism and and sadism. We figured that Lacan Saad with Kant being such a notoriously difficult text, rather than attack it head on, we we wanted to find like like Nick said, a nice metaphor that we could use to make it more clear. And we found no analogy better than Batman and Joker. With that said, we're going to get into what exactly Kant's moral philosophy is and how Saad's moral philosophy relates to that. So Kant's moral philosophy is centered around the categorical imperative. And the categorical imperative is a rule of conduct that is unconditional or absolute for all agents. Uh, the validity of a claim which does not depend on any desire or end. Kant seeks to create an ethical system that is based in reason and which is internally consistent and not contingent on extrinsic factors outside of a subject. What is opposed to the ethical project or the progression to an ethical subject is that which is pathological, being completely beholden to these sensibilities, instinct, hunger, this uh, a libido, a sexual drive. What Kant thought was special about humans is that they had the faculty of reason. So for Kant, freedom basically being ethical is using this faculty of reason to slowly but surely attain uh, an ethical position. Yeah, and I think that pathological has a particular connotation today but i think that kant's conception of pathological is broader and and includes many things that aren't included just in mental health but in terms of all the ways in which we are determined by our conditions and our intuitions and our aptitudes and all the things that sort of determine us that are the product of our material existence as beings in the world a way to distill Kant's philosophy is it's the law that you give to yourself. For Kant, no one can give you your duty, and you can't hide behind your duty. You can't say, oh, I had to do this, it was my duty. Your duty is, for Kant, is the very thing which you have to be responsible for. Well, I think now would be a good time to juxtapose this to the Saadian ethics or the Saadian moral philosophy. But for those who are unfamiliar with Saad, Saad was this 18th century literary figure who uh, wrote these, what were at the time and even today, are these obscene texts where what were called libertines uh, over and over again in very meticulous detail tortured their victims, uh, raped their victims, and performed all these sort of wicked acts and deeds on innocent people. Saad was writing very close after Kant's critique of, of pure reason. Lacan notices that it's not a coincidence that Saad was writing so closely after Kant. Uh, and Lacan positions Saad as an Enlightenment figure, just as Kant. At, at a superficial level, it seems ridiculous to call Saad a Enlightenment figure, since he seems so much against reason. We want to show how he actually is a moralist and that his philosophy of ethics are actually pretty Kantian. What would you say is the morality of a libertine? Yeah. Saad situates his ethics within an object, unlike Kant, whereas Kant is a sort of pure idealist. Saad is this very base materialist, and he sort of asserts that we are objects of nature and thus our desires are natural and we should follow them and that we have a right to follow them. 
and and he sort of bases his philosophy on a different conception of human freedom that is the freedom to dominate to impose your will on other people to to utilize your freedom to satisfy your desires no matter the cost to others that you owe no responsibility to any sort of conception of the social or the good in that sense you could make the argument that the libertine is following a sort of moral like you said it's what nature wants from them so they position themselves as sort of instruments of nature's chaos and for them that is the ethical that is what's moral yeah sod's will to enjoy at at any cost is very similar to kant's categorical imperative because they're not based in sort of any of the things that determine us, any of our social positionality, our, our being in the, the, the world, but our self-referential. I think, I think the, the, the continuity between Saad and, uh, and Kant, while we sort of outlined it here, I think it'll become a lot clearer once we use, obviously, our, our case study, which is, which is Batman and the Joker, reduced down to this narrative structure. Yeah, I think the Batman and the Joker are like the perfect metaphor for the relationship between Kant and Saad. I think that Batman is very much a Kantian hero more than any other hero. And I think that Joker certainly embodies the sadistic libertine figure, although not nearly as sexualized, which I think is probably for the best. So the question is, is Batman following a categorical imperative? Or what is Batman's categorical imperative? Batman's categorical imperative is his rule that he does not kill people, I would say, is his most kind of clear categorical. Across the Batman series, Batman has had the opportunity to kill, but refuses to, regardless of who the person is. And so he won't even kill the Joker, even though killing the Joker would certainly mean, in a utilitarian sense, saving people's lives. I would, I would say that in line with that, or another way of stating that, that his no killing rule is that Bruce Wayne's categorical imperative is to be the Batman, right? Uh, whereas the Batman refuses to kill, thus that is also Bruce Wayne's uh, sort of duty. The, the duty for Bruce Wayne, the duty for duty's sake is basically uh, putting on the suit and fighting crime. He, in a sense, would be a, a Kantian ethical subject because regardless of any of the outcome of his actions, regardless even of his desires, he's constantly rejecting even his, even his romantic interests to put on the suit and continue being Batman. And even when the Joker makes it obviously clear that not unmasking himself and continuing to be this masked Batman will cause more harm and will uh, will result in more death, Batman just can't do it. So just kind of like Kant, no condition influences Batman's duty to be Batman. Batman, he has to do it. That's just who he is. Yeah, Batman is not a utilitarian hero. As we know, Bruce Wayne is a, a multi-billionaire um, who could do much more good on a structural level, doing any number of things that would systemically improve the lives of people in Gotham. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he fights criminals in a bat costume. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the the thing I was trying to navigate was that like it at at face value, it does seem as though there is this imposition of duty on Batman that he constantly acknowledges like once Gotham doesn't need me, but Gotham time and time again proves to him that it doesn't need him, or in fact it would be better off without him. Yet here we are, twenty twenty installments of Batman later, and he's still the Batman. And I think he does see that. He he does feel a lot of guilt. And in that sense, he is also he does take responsibility for for his 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 action or his decision to be the Batman. He ba Gotham existed before Batman. No one in Gotham was out in the street pounding the pavement demanding a Batman. 
he he took upon he took it upon himself to adopt the the Batman as a symbol of the moral ethical order and to go out every night and fight crime. And and so now just like Kant was not an ethical subject, Batman Bruce Wayne is obviously a divided subject as the con says every subject is. So how exactly is it that Batman what makes him not necessarily a pure ethical subject? I think that Batman isn't a pure ethical subject, which is something that I think the Joker very much makes a critique of that that Batman has a desire to be the Batman. Batman's duty and his desire have been suffused into one thing. That's very much what the Joker is trying to get out of Batman in the Dark Knight through their conflict. The Joker very quickly recognizes Batman's enjoyment of his status as Batman. Right. Yeah, I think I think that everyone except Batman is constantly diagnosing him. One of the first things that are said that is said to Batman is that's not my diagnosis. I think Batman says, I don't need help. And then um, the Scarecrow, who is actually also a psychiatrist, says, that's not my diagnosis. And I think that Rachel says it really clearly when she says there might be a point when the city no longer needs Batman. But that will there be a point when you no longer need Batman? Bruce Wayne is ignoring his own unconscious investment in 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 the Batman and in the ways in which he enjoys the sacrifices that he makes to be the Batman that he doesn't want to have a normal life. I think that's a good way of putting it. We can uh, circle back to the point about Saad and Kant being beyond the pleasure principle. Like everything about being the Batman is pain and suffering. And so Bruce Wayne, his body's getting battered. He's constantly caught in this tension of guilt. Yet he continues to be the Batman. You said it perfectly that he he takes enjoyment from the sacrifices he makes. Yeah. And I I think this is why desire and duty are so similar and they they both have the same structure because batman is at one time both a pathological subject who is deriving enjoyment from the pain of being the batman and at the same time he's an ethical subject who is given himself this duty to be the batman and his persistence beyond this pain is also ethical and so both desire and ethics are constitutive of the same lack that exists within Bruce Wayne's subjectivity. I think this is a great time to bring up the relationship between Saad and the and the Joker. So the Joker uh, is the parallel to the Saudi and Libertine. The difference between the Joker and the Batman are pretty obvious. Even the the relate the relation between the Joker and a Saudi libertine at face value is also sort of clear, uh, but there's some subtleties that we wanna that we wanna outline. But the first thing we'll just get across what is clear is that just like the Saudi libertine, the Joker also sees himself as a sort of agent of chaos, or another way of putting it is an instrument of nature, which the Joker sees as in, is inherently evil. Uh, lacking any sort of order, uh, just kind of up to chance, inherently unfair. In, in that sense, the Joker makes himself this ethical subject by simply following the edicts of nature. I think what makes the Joker an evil but ethical subject is, in the, the sort of Kantian sense is that Joker has no pathological motives outside of reproducing chaos in the social order. Um, the Joker isn't motivated by money or, um, other things that motivate criminals, any sort of, there's no personal benefit for the Joker other than his enjoyment of being an agent of chaos. The fact that he enjoys through the other, or the fact that he doesn't necessarily enjoy the evil acts, but what it seems to, that he enjoys the most is getting people to stoop down to his level 
points also to the libertine. What, what motivates them is the will of nature. So if they're able to satisfy the desire of nature, then they are able to enjoy themselves for themselves. He, he's ultimately looking to break people in a similar way that a Sadian torturer seeks to break their victims. The, the Sadian torturer is always alternating between philosophically trying to convince the victim of the sort of cruelty of nature and exacting the most painful tortures on their bodies. And then this is very much the Joker's relationship to Batman. Um, there's even a scene, I think, in which they're in an interrogation room. Joker says, like, given the right conditions, people will eat each other. And the Joker is very much trying to produce those conditions by showing that there is nothing that stops people from destroying each other. What's wrong with that, really? It's not like we're contractually tied down to rationality. There is no sanity clause. And in that sense, it's also kind of beyond the pleasure principle. In the very nature of his duty, if he died under the right circumstances, that would sort of be ethical to him. There's that scene where the Batman's driving his, driving his motorcycle head on in, into the direction of the ba- of the Joker, and the Joker's just standing there. He doesn't get out of the way. He's saying, come on, do it, do it, kill me, or hit me. That's what gets the Joker the most excited. The, mo- the purest of subjects, the purest of ethical subjects, is close to, to disobeying his duty. You made it such a great point when you mentioned that Joker is just this pure embodiment of the death drive and, and the way in which he can win even in his own death and, and, and encourages people to kill him if it breaks their moral code. There's that scene where he has Harvey Dent put the gun to his head because if Harvey Dent kills him, he will have lost his sort of moral core that makes him such an effective crime fighter and makes him such a an agent of the moral order. So I, I think this brings us to the question, just like we had the question uh, about Batman. Ostensibly, he is this ethical subject who's following his duty. He's He makes himself the agent of, of chaos, right? Or the agent of nature. Um, he himself is the one. He takes responsibility for his actions in a sense. I don't think he... He necessarily hides behind his duty. How is the Joker not a purely ethical subject? What is it that makes him a divided subject? I think that his subjectivity can really be seen in his limits, um, that he can't ever be fully successful because he, who is trying to destroy the social symbolic order, has a position within it. As much as he tries to efface himself from the symbolic order through face paint and sort of his ever-changing origin story, he can't totally destroy the ethical, symbolic order. And I think that that limitation is an indication of his subjectivity. So this is a a Danny Novus quote. Uh, Were everyone to be immodest and the moral law of the right to Juissance were effectively, effectively a universal rule, the libertine would no longer have a need to issue his edicts and would paradoxically lose much of his Jewessance. This is why Lacan had stated earlier that the libertine's will to Jewessance drills a hole in the other, for the will to Jewessance rests on the fundamental assumption that somewhere there is a locus of non Jewessance, upon which the libertine's own Jewessance depends. I think this goes to basically what you were saying is like if 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 he if he were to I guess truly be an ethical subject, he would lose any access to Jewess And so the most ethical thing he could do is to kill the Batman so as to help him instate this this chaos. But he needs the Batman to torture over and over again. I think we really covered it well. I think that that really brings us very well into our final section on the now that we have all the pieces putting them together of Kant, Saad, Batman, and the Joker. So the question of this section, or the, the final question, is what is the common denominator between Kant and Saad, or Batman and the Joker? How is it that they aren't actually these opposed you know, villain and hero, but are actually in one sense, they need each other to exist. And in another sense, 
they're actually kind of interchangeable, constituted by the same lack, perhaps. I think that Kant and Saad exist in a dialectical relationship to each other in the same way that the Batman and the Joker do. And the dialectic between Kant and Saad is the product of the division of our subjectivity and, and the lack at the core of being. Well, the point we want to get across, right, is that following one's duty and following one's desire are sort of interchangeable. That has a lot of implications for any system of ethics. But the quote is from Zupanchik. Lacanian psychoanalytic theory contains a notion that captures this Kantian conception of pure form very well. It's plus de jour, can't pronounce that, but plus de jour or surplus enjoyment, objet petit a. It can be shown that the Kantian concept of pure form and the Lacanian concept of the objet petit a are actually introduced to resolve a very similar, if not uh, resolve very similar, if not identical problems. The same conceptual necessity which drives Kant to distinguish between form as the form of something and pure form leads Lacan to distinguish between demand as the articulation of a need and desire, which has as its object the object designated, designates by the letter A. So what I think is important is Lacan's distinguishing between demand as the formulation of a need, like a specific content, as this like a demand for something, and desire itself, which has as its object the letter A, basically an algebraic variable. It could be filled with anything, uh, and what it's filled with is sort of uh, irrelevant because it never, it never satisfies the the desire itself. What's operative isn't the object of desire, but the very form of an object. Uh, just like Kant's object of the ethical will is itself duty, at full stop, a mere container, the content of which is sort of irrelevant. To put it simply, both duty and desire are pure forms in that they're both beyond any any materiality. They both sort of are orbiting the same void, and both Batman and the Joker are responding to the same sort of radical freedom that is the sort of condition of possibility of human subjectivity. Right. Yeah. All of ethics, and as Lacan describes, subjectivity starts from this lack, right? And is completed by the individual in the act. Because it starts from a lack, we have this radical freedom. So this is another Zupanchik quote. Thus, we can see that the object drive involved in Kant's conceptualization of ethics is not just like any other pathological motivation, but neither is it simply the absence of all motives or incentives. The point, rather, is that this very absence must at a certain point begin to function as the incentive. It must attain a certain material weight and positivity, otherwise it'll never be capable of exerting any influence whatsoever on a human conduct. And Lacan has a very similar point about the void. And to me, I think Lacan was in his own enlightenment thinker way or idealist way, was also able to circumscribe that lack. He identified this paradox in the sense that, you know, the, the, the categorical imperative, it has an absence of all motives or incentives, yet it still becomes the mover of someone's actions. But how is that possible? How can an absence, how can a lack of incentive become the object of your will? And I think that's a, that's a core Lacanian um, dialectic and Hegelian dialectic too, is that limits and freedom go hand in hand, or that we are free to the extent that we are limited. Yeah, right? I think there, there's an impossibility that structures both the satisfaction of desire and the fulfillment of the duty. Um, and that's why I think the Joker and Batman are such perfect foils. They're both people that are, are chasing impossibility. And that puts them in direct confrontation with each other. In this sort of infinite confrontation. That can never have a satisfying end. I think they're, they're truly iconic characters. Because they speak to the, 
the core of our subjectivity and and what what it means to to be a person and to exist in a world in which we have to confront the the void which is the condition of possibility for our freedom as subjects and we have to live with the the agony of being free thank you so much for sticking with us this has been death drive dialectics uh, i'm nicholas tolliver here with tyler moraz and we hope to be putting out more content in the future uh, our lives have been a little bit busy but we hope to be producing more stuff and so if you're interested please like comment and subscribe uh, share this with people you might think would be interested in in what we're doing in our work please leave feedback um, we love to engage with our audience we read everything that y'all write in the comments if you're here at the very end you are part of the select few but you are